In the shadows of fame, power and superstition, a chilling tale unfolds. Mona Fendi, once a Malaysian pop diva, fell into the abyss of witchcraft and orchestrated the most gruesome murder in Malaysian history. Borno Masna Ismail on January 15, 1956 in Perlis, Mona believed she was destined for stardom and began singing and dancing from a very young age. She also appears on television worldwide as a water ballet dancer, captivating audiences with her mesmerizing performances. In her early 20s, Mona ventured into the Malaysian music industry. She released an album titled Diana One in 1987, her hit single Ku Nyanyikan Lagu Ini, and made several television appearances. However, her once glittering career shattered, leaving her penniless and searching for a new path. Little did she know that her darkest chapter was yet to unfold. Frustrated, Mona immersed herself in another type of performance, witchcraft. Assisted by her third husband, Muhammad Afandi Abdul Rahman, who studied martial arts and black magic in Indonesia, Mona began offering her services to affluent and powerful figures, including high-profile politicians who paid large amounts of money for charms and talismans, seeking help in attaining higher positions in government and achieving success, wealth and health. Mona's youthful appearances and charisma set her apart from traditional bomos, establishing her as a prominent figure in the industry. The couple enjoyed their newfound wealth, owning multiple bungalow throughout Malaysia, but prefer staying in luxurious five-star hotels in Kuala Lumpur. They also possess an impressive collection of luxury cars, including a Jaguar, Mercedes-Benz, BMW, and a station wagon. Her services attracted Dato Maslan Idris, a US-educated politician and the Batu Talam assemblyman of Pahang to her daughter. Step. In July 1993, he sought the assistance of Mona and her husband in his quest to climb the party ranks within AMNO and secure the position of chief minister. On July 2, 1993, Dato Maslan was reported missing after withdrawing 300,000 ringgit from several banks in Kuala Lumpur, raising concerns as he failed to attend his scheduled party meetings. His family grew increasingly worried as he deliberately avoided all forms of communication, leaving them with only a text message indicating his departure for route. The investigation into Dato Maslan's disappearance hit a snap when the police struggled to find any leads. However, a week later during a routine police patrol, they arrested a man high on drugs. The man, identified as Juraimi Hussein, was taken to the police station for questioning. His statements were rambling and incoherent at first, but the police picked up some critical pieces of information, including a name, Maslan Idris. Zaman Khan, then the police director of Bukit Aman, zeroed in on a couple who allegedly sold Datuk Maslan's Mercedes to a Chinese businessman in Pudu. Reports indicated that the couple went on a shopping spree in Kuala Lumpur, splurging on jewellery, luxury items, furnitures and even a facelift, spending a staggering 315,000 ringgit within a few days, almost identical to the sum Maslan had withdrawn from the bank before his disappearance. On 22nd of July 1993, Draimin led the police to a shocking discovery, an abandoned house where, buried 1.8 meters beneath a storeroom and sealed with a concrete cap, they uncovered most of Maslan's Maslan's body parts. The arrest of Mona, her husband, Afandi, and Juraimi became a global media sensation. People were intrigued by the story of a young, glamorous couple in their 30s embroiled in an occult-related murder. Trials begin at the Tamalo High Court, preceded over by Judge Dato Mokhtar Siddin, with a seven-person jury. Throughout the trial, prosecutors presented an extensive body of evidence, including 70 witnesses and 295 exhibits. Here's what happened. Mona and her husband made a promise to Maslan, offering him the chief minister position for 2.5 million ringgit. They claimed to possess a talisman consisting of a cane and songkok, allegedly owned by former Indonesian President Sukarno. Maslan paid 500,000 ringgit as deposit and provided 10 land titles as collateral for the remaining payments. On July 2, 1993, Mona invited Maslan to her mansion in Raup for a cleansing ritual. She led Maslan to the kitchen, where he lay on his back on a raised platform while Mona performed the flower bathing ceremony. And when the ritual reached its climax, she whispered to Maslan, Tilt your head back and close your eyes. You hear money falling from the sky. Without warning, Joami swung an axe at Maslan's neck three times, completely severing his head, and skinned Maslan's body, cutting it into 18 pieces before burying the remains in a shallow pit. Police never found the other missing body parts, sparking speculations that the trio might have consumed them as part of the ritual. 
the media frenzy allowed Mona Fendi to satisfy her insatiable desire for fame and attention. She reveled in the spotlight like a Hollywood celebrity, treating every court hearing as if she were arriving at a movie premiere. As she entered the courtroom, escorted by the police, Mona posed for the cameras, flashing her brightest green. Dressed in extravagant designer outfits, she ensured she was always camera ready. Looks like I have many fans, she exclaimed. Mona would request daily newspapers from the prison guards, relishing in her headlines and pictures of herself. Thank you, you and you, for featuring such flattering stories and pictures of me, she told reporters. During the trial, Mona even offered to sing for the judge. Witnesses reported hearing strange noises, causing some people to flee in fear. Dark rumors began circulating that Mona intended to sacrifice eight lives to attain supernatural abilities. Maslai was the seventh victim. After a trial that held the nation in suspense, the jury delivered a unanimous guilty verdict on February 9, 1995, condemning Mona, Afandi and Juraimi to the death penalty. Mona expressed her gratitude saying, I'm happy and thank you to all all Malaysians, departing the courtroom with a smile. They were transferred to the infamous Kajang prison, known for housing death row inmates. Saja Aziza, the prison officer who monitored Mona, witnessed her praying five times daily and reciting the Quran regularly. She was very friendly, often sharing stories about her children and exchanging cooking tips with the guards. Surprisingly, her ex-husband, a policeman himself, claimed that deep down, Mona is very kind. He even said she can't even kill an ant and would cry while cleaning the fish, let alone dismembering a human being. But well, perhaps there was more to Mona Fendi than meets the eye, leaving us to ponder the true nature of her character. The final hours before their hanging, the couple spent precious moments with their children and advised them to grow up to be good people and juggle diri bai bai. On November 2nd, 2001, at 5.55 a.m., Mona Fendi, her husband Afandi, and their accomplice Jeremy were led to the gallows. Mona uttered her final words, Aku tak akan mati. The murder of Maslan Idris not only shocked Malaysia, but propelled Mona to a level of notoriety beyond her pop star career. Even over 20 years after her death, the media frenzy surrounding the case and the subsequent release of a movie based on her life continued to fuel public fascination. During the 15th general elections in Malaysia, some people even took to Twitter, urging Mona to return and banish the corrupt politicians. Mona's story stands as a cautionary tale of the consequences that await those who, like Mona and Maslan, made morally questionable actions driven by an insatiable hunger for fame and power that ultimately led to their downfall. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Take care and goodbye.